Welcome to the second episode of Matinees on Main Street. My name is Alan. This is the podcast about the history of the movies. For the time being, we'll be talking about the way the movies were developed, but we'll also talk about the people who did the developing, as well as the very first clips of film that appeared. In the last episode, we followed a few early chemists who blazed a trail that led to the creation of the photographic process. Today's story will follow one photographer and his investor. These two gentlemen will try to use photography to take a picture of a running horse. Years later, they would push that idea even farther as they attempt to take pictures of horses in various stages of running. After that, the photographer would use a magic lantern that could change those images fast enough to give the impression that the image of the horse was running. But that won't happen in today's story. Today, I'll introduce these two men as they struggle to solve their first photographic problem, despite the limits of photography in the early 1870s. The first person we meet is the photographer. Originally, his name was Edward Muggeridge, but we know him as Edward Mybridge. He was born and raised in a small town to the west of London, a town that would become lost in London suburbia a century later. There doesn't seem to be anything remarkable about his childhood. Both of his parents' families were relatively well off. They owned farms and ran businesses. Some even owned real estate. His father's father ran a stationery company and taught Edward a little bit about the business. His mother's family was a little bit better off than his father's, and when Edward was three, his father died. That seemed to cut Edward out of the line of any inheritance, although his relatives did help him out on occasion. When Muggeridge was old enough, he took off for London and possibly worked for a stationery company that may have been run by relatives in his father's family. There's also a possibility that Edward may have taken a job with a company known as the London Printing and Publishing Company. Apparently, the owners were looking for a publishing agent to work at their store in New York City. That's where Muggeridge would soon travel. Edward Muggeridge arrived in New York in 1850. His job was to arrange reams of printed paper that had been shipped from London and organize them to be printed as books. He also sold lithographs and other forms of reprinted artwork. In 1855, he traveled to New Orleans, where he also worked in the publishing industry. At that time, Muggeridge changed his last name to Mybridge. It's not known why, but Mybridge seems to have tried on a series of names during his career. Within six months, he left for San Francisco. In the five years he worked in the Bay Area, Mybridge continued his job as a seller of books, although it's impossible to figure out who he was working for or even if he was working for himself. However, he seems to have done fairly well. At around the same time, his brothers traveled to California in search of gold. When his brother George died in California from TB in 1859, Mybridge sold what was left of his book and lithographic art business to his other brother Thomas and left on what seems to have been an attempted tour of Europe. He may have also had some concern for his mother, or he may have simply wanted to see Europe. Mybridge was always seeking ways to make money, and at the time, London may have been the better place to be. Taking a stagecoach back to New York, Edward faced a terrible experience. Somewhere near the Texas border, the driver of the stagecoach lost control of his team of Mustangs. Mybridge attempted to escape by cutting through the leather-bound back end of the coach, only to be thrown out, striking his head on some rocks. He awoke nine days later in a bed at Fort Smith, Arkansas. The stagecoach had had a tragic accident. 
two passengers had died and everyone remaining on the stagecoach had been injured. The injury to Mybridge's head had bruised his brain, causing Mybridge to suffer from double vision for quite some time. He also suffered from a loss of sense of smell and taste. He also found that he was quite mentally confused, so he stayed in the East to recover. Mybridge filed a $10,000 lawsuit against the stagecoach company and negotiated a settlement of $2,500. Eventually, he made it to London. Mybridge arrived in England just in time for America's Civil War to break out. He was 30 years old at the time and still recovering from a traumatic head injury. What he had in mind was patenting and selling a washing machine that he had invented. The British government issued a patent, but Mybridge found the English manufacturers weren't interested in making his experimental washing machine. Discouraged, he traveled to Paris to solicit the French, and while he met with the same disinterest, he discovered that the city was still quite mad for photography. According to one account, Paris had 700 photographers, with the average photographer taking five portraits each day at a cost of $7 per portrait. Mybridge bought a complete photographic setup, camera, chemicals, glass plates, and the various items needed to develop photos, and learned how to use it. There are some who think he may have learned photography in England, but it's more likely that the people who taught him were in Paris, as he took on the professional name of Helios for marketing his photographs. Helios was a name used by a camera firm in Paris. He would continue to use that name when he returned to San Francisco. My bridge was an eccentric man, and due to his ramshackle appearance, it's easy to think of him as a footloose vagabond or an eccentric bum toting around a box camera and equipment. But that's not quite who he was. He was very comfortable with wealthy people, and he seemed to have earned his share of money. One of his friends, Joseph Thwaite, observed that Mybridge had a lot of money at times. While Edward was in England, he got involved in an investment scheme with a family member, and they did well until the bubble burst. He was also one of a number of men who invested in a West Coast silver mine. After he returned to America, there were solicitations from English investors posted in a number of American newspapers attempting to contact Edward Muggeridge concerning some of his investments. Unfortunately, when Mybridge returned to San Francisco, he was broke, and the name Edward Muggeridge was gone forever. All he had were his cameras, his marketing name, Helios, and a new personal name, Edward Mybridge, E-A-D-W-E-A-R-D-M-U-Y-B-R-I-D-G. He now used the medieval spelling of his first name. From now on, that would be the spelling for which he is remembered. During the 1850s and 60s, photography became one of America's latest get-rich-quick schemes. In most cities, a person could find quite a number of businesses offering to photograph people using the daguerreotype and or the ambrotype processes. Ambrotype was one of the marketing names for the wet plate process that was mentioned in the last episode. You could also find businesses offering color-tinted photographs, cameos with photographs, photographic cards known as the carte de visite, and stereo photographs that were used with stereo opticon gadgets. These machines were the 19th century version of the Viewmaster toys that some of us had as children. When he returned to San Francisco, my bridge partnered with an old friend, Silas Selleck. Selleck had been a friend since their days in New York. He had trained with the city's well-known photographer, Matthew Brady, and now worked as a daguerreotypist in the city by the bay. 
During Mybridge's book-selling days, the two men had hung out together in San Francisco, and Mybridge now started selling photographic prints to Selex Gallery. Mybridge established himself as a popular landscape photographer, specializing in places like the Yosemite Valley or the Redwood Forests. He shot numerous panoramas of San Francisco and even shot pictures of a Native American war up in the Sierra Nevadas. Sometime around 1870, he became familiar with the owners of the Central Pacific Railroad. There are two stories about how that happened. Supposedly, it was his landscape photographs at the Nall Gallery that got their attention. But according to some, it was not his landscape work, but one of his side hustles, taking pictures of houses of wealthy patrons, which brought him to their attention. What is probably more true is a combination of the two. Probably, Judge Edwin Crocker hired Mybridge to photograph his Sacramento mansion after talking with someone at the gallery. Once Crocker showed the collection of photographs to his friends, the Stanfords hired Mybridge to photograph their massive homes. Once Edward Mybridge and Leland Stanford came together, another significant piece of the motion picture puzzle fell into place. If you had asked someone at that time who was the richest people in America, the name you might have received would have been probably the Astors. But by 1870, the wealthiest men in the country were connected to the Transcontinental Railroad Project. Dreams of spanning the United States with a railroad went back to the 1840s. This dream was encouraged when pioneers flocked to the West Coast to settle the Willamette Valley, of Oregon and to pan for gold in Northern California. The project was just one of many dreams hung up in Congress as the North and South argued over the slavery question. The building of the railroad got started around the same time that the Civil War broke out. Two different rail lines had to be built, one coming from California and the other from Nebraska. They were to meet somewhere out west a point that ended up being in northern Utah. The line that came from Nebraska was called the Union Pacific and turned out to be the most corrupt private investment project in American history. The man who ran it was financier Thomas Durant, and he set the standard for financial misbehavior in the Gilded Age. He spent a number of years delaying the company's startup. He stalled the construction of the westbound railroad in order to finagle a better deal. He created corporations that bought material from the investors and sold it at highly inflated prices to his railroad. The American public, through the U.S. government, was paying the bill, but that didn't matter. Durant built slipshod tracks and bridges. He also ran the line in a ridiculously wandering path in order to collect on the government's payment by the mile. Finally, this corruption was covered by a crooked investment scheme known as the Credit Mobilier. Investing in Durant's crooked finance company was a golden bauble that he used to entangle numerous congressmen and government officials in his project. To be honest, many Americans at that time tended to look the other way when it involved major investment projects. Only when the corruption spilled out into the public did people get angry. The history of railroad building in America was a history of corruption, and a person would have a hard time finding an honest project along America's iron rails. Surprisingly, the West Coast trunk of the rail which was called the Central Pacific, was more honestly managed, relatively speaking. Four men were involved, Collis Huntington, Mark Hopkins, Charles Crocker, and Leland Stanford. In one way or another, they were all shopkeepers in Sacramento, California. They made their money selling goods to the Gold Rush 49ers, and they wanted a transcontinental railroad that would help bring goods and people to the West Coast. One of those four men is important to this story, Leland Stanford. Stanford was born in upstate New York, where he trained in law. 
For a time, he practiced in Wisconsin, but his business burned down, leaving him without receipts to claim the debts he owed. He and his wife, Jenny, returned to New York. During this time, his brothers had moved out to California and established a successful merchandising store in Sacramento. The brothers' newfound wealth was celebrated in the letters they wrote to their parents and to their brother. Leland dumped his wife off at her parents' house and took off to share in his brother's financial glory. After helping to grow his brother's business, Stanford partnered with Huntington, Crocker, and Hopkins. Many of the businesses in Northern California felt restricted because of their inability to ship or receive goods in a timely manner. When Theodore Judah started promoting his scheme for a transcontinental railroad that would pass through the Sierra Nevadas, the four men were hooked. Long before Thomas Durant was obfuscating the Union Pacific's corrupted roots, Huntington, Crocker, Hopkins and Stanford started to finance the Central Pacific part of the line. The men divided the work among themselves. Collis Huntington went east to lobby Congress and the President, as well as to grease as many wheels as he could. Charlie Crocker worked as a general contractor, while his brother Edwin worked as legal counsel. Mark Hopkins was the group's comptroller, and Stanford seems to have been the company's West Coast lobbyist. Actually, the others seemed to think that Stanford didn't do much work at all, although whatever work he did do seemed to have threatened his health. He was elected California's governor in 1861, but after his two-year term, his involvement with the railroad project seemed less obsessive than did the work of the others. He did schmooze with West Coast politicians, and he helped to buy out local competition. But as Huntington had managed to get the national government involved in the project, any West Coast political work was now considered secondary in importance. The Central Pacific started to make money by taking miners and supplies into the mining regions of Northeast California and Western Nevada. Destroying their competition also helped them financially. The interconnected railroad monopoly that they were building would soon be known as the octopus. Between the monopoly, the transporting of miners and their supplies, and the U.S. government's track mileage reimbursements, the four men, as well as Judge Crocker, were sitting on a lot of money. All of the men started to use their money to advertise their wealth and spend according to their interests. Both Huntington and Crocker started art collections. Stanford started collecting musical automatons. These were mechanical novelties that made music, and he distributed them throughout his mansion. By the end of the decade, Stanford also started to buy racehorses. This last hobby leaves a lot of film historians asking, why? According to the story, Stanford's health was threatened by the stress he suffered from the building of the railroad. His doctor suggested outdoor activities such as vacationing and even working with horses. Stanford chose the latter. Some people believe he did so due to a long-term love of horses, especially as he treated them very well as an owner. He seemed to enjoy taking care of them as well as buying and trading them. But why race horses? Stanford said that he loved the beauty of them, which puzzled people who saw them as objects of gambling. Supposedly, Stanford didn't bet on his horses. Being as he was already one of the wealthiest men in the country, there would have been no reason for him to do so except in the name of pride, or if he had a problem with gambling. Stanford's career in horse racing started with Occident. Occident was considered a workhorse, although he may have had some racing blood in his ancestry. Most of his pedigree, if you can call it that, was from horses that traveled west to California. They were workhorses, wagon train horses, cart horses, and the like. Originally, the horse's name was Charlie, and after he spent his youth running wild in the pasture, 
he was purchased and tamed to haul a cart. Much of his young life was spent hauling wagons for men who transported goods until a horseman named Sid Eldred spotted him in 1869. At that time, Charlie was already eight years old. Eldred bought him for $300, named him Wonder, and after training him with a sulky, he raced him in Sacramento. Eldred knew Stanford, and after the race, Wonder was sold to Stanford for $4,000 in gold and renamed Occident. When we think of horse racing, we think of little men riding on top of horses that run at a full gallop. Generally, this kind of racing is very hard on a horse's legs, so they're usually set out to pasture or stud within a few years. Sulky racing is different. A jockey sits in a cart that's pulled by the horse. The horse does not run. Instead, he trots. Trotting is much easier on a horse's legs, and they can have a long racing career. A horse like Occident could start a career at the age of 10, something unheard of in today's horse racing. Until the arrival of the automobile, horses were a part of everybody's life. A well-off family had carriages and probably stabled their horses nearby, if not at home. The many farmers that filled America's heartland had their own barns to keep horses. Horses of different kinds were used for plowing, transporting, pulling, traveling, and other types of chores. People raised horses, rode horses, petted them, fed them, cleaned their stables, and sold them when they grew old. Horses were like pets, and every neighborhood, town, and city had to deal with a horse manure problem. Horses were as familiar to those people as were their dogs and cats. At the time, Stanford's interest was not in understanding the intricacies of a horse's gallop. Instead, he was much more interested in the simple grace of a horse's movement, especially Occident's. Occident was fast set a number of track records. Still, he lost his first races because he had a hard time dealing with the crowds. He was a small horse, but had perfect stature. The New York Herald described him as having faultless symmetry and perfect form, with fine breathing capacity and great propelling power. So while Occident was predicted to be a world-class trotter, it was Occident's perfect form that seemed to have enchanted Stanford. Occident had not yet won a major race when Stanford contacted Mybridge. Stanford admitted to the press why he commissioned Mybridge to do the photography. It was to provide an image of his horse for his friends who lived far from his West Coast grounds. He had talked up Occident to them, and now he wanted to show them the beauty of his horse. During this 1873 photo shoot, there was no intention of capturing a horse with all four feet off the ground, although if they achieved that, it would have been frosting on the cake. When Stanford finally mentioned to Mybridge what he wanted in the way of a photograph, Mybridge was astonished. Stanford wanted a photograph of Occident in full trot. It would show his prize horse's form and beauty, even though no one had attempted what would later be considered a sports photograph. As far as Mybridge was concerned, he figured the entire stunt was impossible, but Stanford told him that if he gave it some thought, he might come up with a practical solution. Finally, in late May of 1872, Stanford, Mybridge, and several others met at the Union Racetrack on the edge of Sacramento. This would prove to be a three-day event. On the first day, Mybridge assessed the lighting situation. The bright sunlight was causing great contrast. To equalize the light, he wanted to reflect the sunlight upon the darker areas of Occident. Bed sheets were collected from a number of houses in the area. These sheets were laid upon the ground, reflecting the sunlight back up upon the horse. This gave the horse's features some definition. Afterwards, the jockey and trainer had to convince Occident that he would have decent footing when he ran across the sheets. Mybridge also had to figure out the camera's timing for such a brightly lit set. 
In those days, what we call a camera was very basic. It was a box with a lens in the front and a slot in the back to hold a glass plate. There was no photo light meter and the lens had no shutter. Every photographer just removed the lens cap and counted the time needed to expose the glass plate. Hopefully you got the timing right. The collodion's exposure rate was slow, so cameras took pictures of still objects. Chemists were working on increasing the camera's sensitivity to light, but that would take time. For a camera of that time, the only way to compensate for a fast-moving object, such as a running horse, was to increase light. Through most of the second day, my bridge experimented with timing and light. None of this proved to be successful. The scientific photographic world had become aware of the speed limitations of the camera obscura. What my bridge needed was something that would allow bright light to enter the camera for only a fraction of a second. In his frustration, my bridge conceived a shutter. It was made of two pieces of wood, one would remain over the lens until a spring forced the piece of wood away from the lens and was replaced by another piece of wood. According to the local newspaper, five one five hundredths of a second existed between those two boards. Within that time, light could pass into the camera. With this primitive shutter mechanism, the box was no longer a passive camera obscura. It was now a camera. On the third day, after some experimentation, my bridge was able to produce a good image. At least it met with Stanford's approval. The Alta California newspaper said that the space of time used to capture the image was so small that you could see individual spokes of the sulky wheel. This comment implies that Fred McCrellish, the reporter, saw the photograph. Unfortunately, the only others who ever saw it were Stanford, Mybridge, and the man who created the lithograph. Wherever it was placed, the photograph is no longer there. It's also possible that McCrellish, as a friend of Stanford, may have embellished the truth a bit, or trusted in Stanford's comments on the event. No one really knows. But a missing photograph doesn't mean that there was no photograph just as it also doesn't mean that there was one. In 1873, all Stanford wanted was a glamour shot of his horse. After the session, he had a lithographic print made up from the photograph, and it's the only visual record of that day. The print does show Occident with all four feet in the air, but they are not positioned in the way that Mybridge's later photograph showed. Was the lithograph's leg arrangement accurate? It doesn't matter, as long as Stanford's friends got their print. A photo had been taken. A print was made and copies were sent, and for the time being, Edward Mybridge and Leland Stanford went back to deal with other issues in their lives. While it's possible that they had discussed later opportunities to take pictures of horses, there's just no proof of that. While Mybridge and Stanford considered this job accomplished, there was still one man who was serious about pushing the boundaries of photography in order to capture movement. He was aware of what the two California men accomplished. He was a physiologist in Paris, and eventually his work would inspire Mybridge and Stanford to reunite to photograph a large number of horses in movement. Next podcast will highlight the French scientist Etienne Jules Marais as he pursues photographing animals at his laboratory in Paris. Thanks for listening.